Nous allons donc désormais ouvrir le troisième panel sur le. Let us open our third panel session on the topic of from low to negative rates, how to keep uh, investing on a sustainable manner. I would like to call the panelists Felix Schufeldt, uh, Pierre Gramegna, Agnès Benassic Kere, Bernard Delas, and Xavier Lanodi Eiffel uh, will moderate the panel session. Let us start this panel session. It's not an easy task uh, on me because uh, we were put a uh, question collectively, which I find very difficult to address. And number two, if there is a que uh, an answer to this question, uh, possibly uh, the answer will come from the audience and maybe not from the panelists. How to invest and ensure uh, and provide insurance coverage in a new environment. And also, uh, we had uh, the uh, two very uh, constructive and, and, and dense uh, panel sessions. And after Bruno Le Maire's uh, uh, speech, a number of avenues for uh, development have been sketched out. Having said all these things and events have happened uh, last summer, and um, a number of you, of course, uh, have uh, taken vacation in August, and a great many of you took vacation in the summer, right? And when um, they uh, went back uh, to their respective scopes uh, in September, uh, they had a shock, and the shock had been caused by uh, these uh, great uh, forward-looking reports uh, as part of Solvency 2, which uh, had showed that uh, given the uh, negative uh, rates, uh, the prospects uh, in the medium and long term, that is uh, five, uh, ten years down the road, for the uh, insurance and for the life insurance industry were quite worrying with respect to the trends being sh uh, sketched out. So this was a wake up call, uh, quite a shock. And this concern with low rates, differently from the panel sessions which looked into the degree of a certainty of the environment. It is a data, it is a reality. And last summer, what has happened has meant that this low rate environment and even negative rate has been a wake up call as being a long lasting reality. So it seemed interesting for us to try and address the impact and consequences of this situation and to have our group of panelists who have uh, their own uh, viewpoints, uh, uh, who will uh, shed lines with uh, Agnès benassi Kere as an economist, as a professor of economics and a member of uh, different uh, committees, but you will uh, be speaking in your capacity as a, an independent economist. Uh, uh, Pierre Gramegna will be uh, talking for, uh, first, uh, knowing that uh, Pierre will have to uh, leave earlier, and he already has uh, spoken to us this morning about his viewpoint, so this will be the government's uh, viewpoint, and then we'll have the regulator's viewpoint, and we uh, have the uh, fortune of uh, having the German and French regulators with the European regulator in attendance. It's just a perfect world, so I would ask each one of you to sketch out what, according to them, are the main consequences on the general economy, on the financial industry, of course, and of course on the insurance industry of this low rate situation before we try and look into the, the, the possibilities for the industries to respond and to adapt. Uh, thank you very much for these introductory remarks, which uh, sets the scene for our exchanges. Uh, what I will try and do is to put forward two or three points of argument to possibly start discussions, uh, initiate some kind of discussions uh, for you to continue the discussions, knowing that I will have to leave. and I. Uh, 
apologize for that uh, to leave early. Now I would like to take some historical perspective. When I was a student in Paris, the word deflation, deflation was a word which wasn't taught in school anymore. Uh, inflation was the only word uh, which was taught. Uh, the inflation rate was a double digit rate. In that context, the uh, European Central Bank uh, set and other member states, central banks, set much lower in inflation targets as it was uh, considered and the, the media and universities and academics would discuss at length that inflation was an issue. And it was set, and you should remember this, a 2% inflation rate, which at the time when it was set, uh, looked extremely low. And now, uh, 30 years down the road, we now have a 2% inflation rate, which uh, looks extremely high. Very strange, right? So Jacques de la Rosière, in a very intelligent manner, said this morning that maybe this inflation rate should be uh, revised downwards, uh, it seems. And it's the first time that I hear someone say this. If we were to revise the rate uh, by only 1% uh, downward, the all uh, the claims and the points of arguments of the Fed and the uh, European Central Bank in the last two years uh, would be totally challenged because Mario Draghi and I greatly I have a high esteem uh, with the man and with the extraordinary uh, policies uh, basically states that we only stand at 1.3 uh, but we could agree that 1.3 is fine if we were to agree on this we would have a, a, a key building block which would uh, uh, vindicate a, a, a a turnaround in the interest rate uh, um, policy. Uh, so Jacques de la Rosière's argument uh, was very simple but very effective. Number two, in my historical perspective, and uh, Bruno Le Maire confirmed this, and the European Central Bank has been saying this as well, uh, get prepared to a very low uh, rate environment for the medium term and even for the long term. And if you listen to them, uh, not Bruno Le Maire, but central bankers basically state that you'll be having uh, very low interest rates for the whole century and uh, make do with it. I think that's not correct intellectually or given the way savings work. Just remember 10, 15 years ago when a central bank wanted to increase or lower interest rates, it was a state secret because they would say you need to avoid insider trading. And therefore, all of a sudden, you would see an increase or decrease by 0.25%, and there would be inquiries to see who cheated. Today, it's the opposite. Without ever anyone asking themselves why is this changed, they say we need foreseeability. So foreseeability now, that worries me. Because if for seeability is over one, two, three years, low interest rates, fine. But to tell me to last for a long time, that's not reasonable. Clearly, when there's a turnaround and the curves, it will have to evolve slowly. We all agree. Our American friends have shown that. They managed very well over two, three years to go from zero something to two, two and a half, which is an interesting rate without any dramatic consequences, neither on the bond market nor on the U.S. economy that did not slow down because of that. Let us learn from the American experience, which shows that we can turn around the charts without slowing down the economy. Vice versa, it's not because we have lowered from uh, negative to minus 0 0.5 that you will stimulate or slow down the economy. So now, the drawbacks of negative Interest rates become increasingly clear. And I'll stop there. This is my third point. We can live with ultra-low interest rates over the medium term. It becomes tough after 10 years, and that's where we are, because most bonds are over 10 years. That's a standard um, term for most states and most private borrowers. So the crisis started in 2008, 2018, 10 years of low rates, and now refinancing, you know this. Is becoming very difficult, very costly. That's a signal that should be taken seriously. And we need to listen to you and understand. And Bruno Le Maire's presentation was uh, quite fascinating in that respect because companies, insurance companies, have a fundamental role to play in the economy. So Solvency II 
Gabriel Bernardino is with us. This is a major challenge. On this point of favoring investments by insurance companies, one key is not to exaggerate ratios when insurance companies buy shares or finance infrastructure. That's certainly one thing. And secondly, in line with what I said today, climate change. If we make a special case of investment in the climate, it would be a smaller scope, of course, but let's try with that. And then we'd have two additional criteria, more investments, two, we organize the energy transition and climate change. All of these parameters put together are important. One last point about Maria Draghi, who is leaving his office. He innovated in an extraordinary fashion. After all, he set up a very accommodating policy that the Americans implemented before us, and it worked. And he did it at European scale. You may disagree with the length of negative rates and so on, but he modernized the European Central Bank, and let's admit it, and thank him for that. Thank you, Mr. Minister. You, you stayed with us. This is wonderful. You went even further than what was said. That's very interesting for the panel discussion. You started by saying that amongst the factors so as to adapt to this new situation, you have uh, responsibilities with respect to monetary policies, and everything hasn't been said yet. You commented on that without calling into question that what has been done so far. We don't have to consider that there's a 10-year paradigm ahead of us. That's important, allowing us to come back and say that in terms of economic policies and not just monetary policies, there may be things that must be found. I would like to turn to Agnès Benassi-Kéré as an economist to ask her for her vision of the impact of negative and low interest rates in the finance sector and tell us more about the different levers that we can find in your vision. Thank you for this invitation. It is true that my problem today when I teach macroeconomics at the University of Paris 1 is to find a student who knows what inflation means. They're all born without inflation. This year, I'm very happy. I'm a Venezuelan student. <laughs> so I said, you explain to the others. I just can't explain it. He understands. It's surprising to see how quickly things have changed. Coming back, I don't agree at all with the idea of this 1% inflation. Don't forget that this is a real economy with companies doing well and less well. And we need inflation to be able to, well, make adjustments. If a company is not doing well, it won't increase wages this year. It's not going to tell its employees minus 2%. That puts some oil in the machine within the country, between sectors doing more or less well, or companies in the same sector, and between countries. If you ask the peripheral countries, to adjust their relative loans with respect to core countries in the U.S. zone, it will take 30 years. If they do that with 0.2% per year, or they'll have negative inflations increasing their debt and an explosive situation. I'm sorry, but I totally disagree with Jacques de la Rosière on that. If you permit, and for the discussion, what's really interesting in Jacques de la Rosière's reasoning this morning was to let us understand that the 2% is not saint, it's not holy. Why 2 or 3, if you could have said 3 or 4? You shouldn't have a doctrine on a given figure. I think we agree on that. Yes, it sh shouldn't be too hot or too cold, like the soup in the fairy tale. Yes, I think he was saying that if we take this new vision, regardless of the figure, whether it's any dogma, we realize that we should now have a monetary policy that's neither accommodating nor restrictive. That's more or less his line of reasoning. But you have the floor. OK, what I'm saying is that you shouldn't hold it against the central bank. They're victims. I have a few pictures I wanted to show. Jacques couldn't show his pictures either. 
I'll start in a way. So I'm speaking on my own behalf and not at all on behalf of the Financial Stability Board. I'd like to start with this chart, uh, R minus G. Piketty just published another book, but along a different line. The differences between interest rates and growth rate. In blue, the US zone, orange Germany, and gray France since 1996. Setting aside the crisis, 2008-2009, it's not that interest rates increased, but growth collapsed. It's important to take things this way. Growth rate minus, well, interest rate minus growth rate. We can see that the trends have been decreasing since 96, even more. It's important to note, too, that Germany in orange has been negative for some time now. Of course, this has consequences that are painful for insurance and life insurance in particular. It's a transfer from creditors to debtors. The best way to manage today is to stop saving and to spend that money immediately and to enjoy life. That's the first uh, conclusion. And that's because a part of their purchasing power should be transferred to debtors so that they can reduce their debt. So the denominator increases faster than the numerator. But the Americans and English did better than we did until a recent date. So maybe they also tend to consume or to invest in purchasing power that will help to uh, boost the economy. The idea is to boost consumption and investments and ultimately reach an inflation rate. Borchan said 4% at the start of the crisis, but we're far from that. So that raises a problem, and we may be amazed at what took place. First of all, the economy policy, creating disorders in the U.S. zone between creditor and debtor countries. Some countries accumulate savings and others accumulate debt. So when you take Money, not with taxes, but it's about the same thing. You have the concept in Germany, <laughs> I'm looking at you, I'd like us to talk about this, about poor investors, poor, say, investors, which is a concept that leaves us amazed in France, because the first decile of income, they save little, so a poor saver or investor is surprising. Let's say modest investors will take from their savings and spend the money. From a macroeconomic standpoint, it's not obvi obvious that consumption investment are stimulated. So we end up with inflation that's low persistently. And underlying core inflation is below 1% in the US for some time now. How do you explain that? You understand it if you realize that the low interest rate is the consequence and not the cause. Low interest rates is because around the world there are too much savings, savings for sh sh secure assets and not enough investments. By the law of supply and demand, interest rates fall apart. Shifting the issue to the other monetary policies, the central bank just tries to reach its goal. It's not necessarily good, but that's what the goal that was set for it. Shifting the discussion to budgetary policies, I believe that the current reform of pensions is a global phenomenon now, it's not only France. Let's say giving more certainty to households, for them to have less uncertainties, that allows households to reduce the precautionary savings. We saw that in China, where households saved a lot because there's no social security system, quite the opposite. So anything that could give a sense of security to households against the different risks in life are good to reduce precautionary savings. Of course, you can have plans for your uh, children's studies or to renovate your home, as the minister said. There's also structural policies that are bad reviewed in France. The idea is to stimulate corporate investments with the regulatory framework. So, and also taxation, which also plays an important role. I'm surprised that in Germany there's not more discussion on corporate taxation because companies have been accumulating a lot of savings that 
without knowing exactly what to do with it today. Two charts. Can I still continue? Oh, yes, very good. After I have a proposal to make. Oh, so I'll go very quickly then. OK. So this is the saving rate on the private sector only. Not, I will not cover the public sector, not to get anyone angry. Only the private sector. Before the crisis in Germany, it gained four points in GDP, plus 3% of GDP in the US zone, a slow growth, and in France, a decline, but not that big. When it comes to gross private investments in orange Germany, we can see, well, you may say that in the 90s, there were too many investments. Investments in Germany were linked to a post-reunification period, so very high. It fell by three GDP points and has not recovered since. Well, plus 3% on savings, minus 3 on investments, plus 6. We wonder why we have a current deficit in Germany. That's why. So this is a one country amongst others. But the global economy is the same thing. Savings rising and interest rates dropping. From a financial standpoint, of course, you may say that have very low interest rates that pushes people to commit crime. The more debt you have, the richer you are, so let's do it. So we can see that French companies accumulated a lot of debt without knowing if that debt corresponds to profitable investments. I'll go very, very quickly on regulators because of regulators in the room. So to cover a very key issue in addition to the lack of investments, the insufficiency of secure assets around the world, safe assets. We have central banks, the ECB has started again, buying lots of safe assets, well scored, public, state-owned uh, bonds that are well scored. And unfortunately, regulations came in to encourage banks and insurers to buy safe assets. So the demand in the year 2000, central banks and emerging countries, but now everyone wants these safe assets. And we have one source of safe assets that's quite dynamic in the US, but that's far less in other parts of the world. And this is a problem causing the interest rates to fall for safe assets, and all the rates are based on that. Bringing me to the international monetary system, not my favorite topic, always dollar-centered, and yet we have a multi multipolar economy. That growth with growth that's not only the U.S. In the year 2000, we already knew this, and we thought that it will end with the crisis of the dollar. And it's ending with what we're seeing today, extremely low interest rates. And another expression of the international monetary system that is imbalanced. This is how we must understand the discussions in the Eurozone on safe assets, euro bonds, and uh, initiatives regarding the budget. Uh, this is my last point now. If you look at the net capital stock in the Eurozone, this is for the overall economy, we haven't returned in real value to the level before the crisis. We'll, we lack some 200 billion. It's important to have an order of magnitude in mind because, uh, let me come back. We could have an angelic vision of things and say that uh, governance, governments that can should carry out budgetary expansion, those who can don't, and things would go better. It's been years and years that we've been hearing this. Nothing happens. The coordination of budgetary policies doesn't work. It makes me think of the monetary policy before. We had the coordination of monetary policies with the European monetary system ended up with a crisis. We said it doesn't work. Let's have a unitary monetary union. We're playing the same game once again with the budgetary policy. We have a system of coordination of budgetary policies that doesn't work. And they want to continue, but maybe we need to have a budgetary layer, let's say federal, that's a big word, let's say a fund. I think, and this would reconcile everyone, that the energy transition is, a, is, is a fortunate in that respect. Because Europeans have to embark on a joint commitment, which is key, joint, because it's 
amazing to be able to move away from this policy. Says I put in 100, I want 100. Here, reducing carbon emissions in Greece, Germany, France, or elsewhere, it doesn't matter. It must be reduced in aggregate. And this justifies having a European instrument. But at the same time, let us not be candid. People often believe that finance can find all solutions without the increase, sharp increase in the price of carbon and can't work because investments, well, won't be profitable. The risk today is to create a green bubble, a financial bubble, because of little offer, a lot of demand, and on the market, you'll find things without any ultimate profitability. So neither insurers, no banks, or central banks should invest in bonds that will not have any ultimate yield. You may say that the figures aren't there, but I think so. If you look at the high-level group of experts on the energy transition for Europe, they are they estimated at 177 billion euros annually in addition to attain the Paris Agreement. A lot of work on our hands. If you're looking for future possible investments, this is a considerable source. Thank you so much, Agnes. Before you leave, Mr. Minister, the Green Fund Aligned Plan, how do you feel about that? I think it will come. I proposed at the last two uh, informal council meetings in Helsinki in September that we should offer a different treatment for investments, green or climate investments, in the Growth Stability Pact without it leading people to scream in the north or elsewhere. And that reassures me. But as you said, and I spoke about this with Gabriel Banadina earlier, above all, we should, must avoid greenwashing. If we do greenwashing, we're lying to ourselves. We're creating a bubble. You didn't even think about the idea of a green bubble, but the risk exists, and we must be vigilant. But this is one avenue. In addition, Europe in this field has a lot to offer. We're in the lead. We are, our population is more aware. So we have a, uh, we're supported by the population to go in this direction. And that is wonderful, because we need Greta Gunberg. What strikes me in people of my generation, the number of people who say, I hate Greta Thunberg, and that annoys me, because I love her. I love her. What's wonderful is that all the young people love her, and the less young, as we are, the majority of people in this room hate her. That's not the right approach. Her message is simple. She mobilized the young, the Paris Agreement, as for all the young and old who signed it and all agreed, we need to do it. We're not going to focus on what this person is saying, where hundreds of millions of young people around the world are mobilized by that. And this is something that gives a positive political ambition, because I've been doing this for six years before as a diplomat, doing lots of other things. It's not easy to be a politician. And uh, when you have an ambition to improve things and you have a topic like this that mobilizes everyone, you must jump on it as an opportunity. And I will listen to what you said. I will enjoy life and I will leave you now. <laughs> Thank you so much and I apologize for leaving hastily. Hello. It was not necessarily expected, uh, the, uh, so how, uh, possibility how to invest in a sustainable way uh, into something greener. Now I turn my attention towards you, Frederick, your regulator one in one of the member states where the, I say the, the debate on monetary policy, very low interest rates and so on, is certainly the most heated in the, in the Union because, as was rightly pointed out, notably by Ines, I mean, uh, German savers have, uh, are very vocal in expressing also the, uh, the defense of, of their cause. So how, as German and as regulator, do you assess the impact of these very low, even negative interest rates on our economies? And would you agree 
that there could also be something to be done to accommodate this structural new situation through reorientation of uh, the function of investment in the economy and of the regulation over investment and financial activities more generally. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's I don't say thank let's you. Come, <laughs> let's come back to the level of more practical financial regulation. Um, I think I tried to cover some of those issues in uh, the last panel already, so I, I, I may come back to that in parts. Um, I, I, of course, listened carefully to uh, Bruno Le Maire's speech, and, and it is perfectly understandable and, of course, entirely legitimate um, to create a political agenda to mobilize resources and capital for any particular purpose, for um, SME companies, for, for uh, greening the system, and so forth. To the extent that money is being provided by the financial system, in particular by insurance companies as, as institutional investors, the regulative role, and I keep insisting on that, is that that is perfectly fine, but not at any price, not at any cost. It is our role to insist that the way how insurance companies invest never forgets their role as being fiduciaries for millions and millions of savers who have entrusted, in many cases, their lifetime savings to an institution called pension or insurance company or something, which are not supposed to do whatever they think they do or whatever a finance minister think they should do. So whatever an insurance company does has to comply with a fiduciary responsibility for millions of policyholders and savers. Let's never, ever forget that. And we, regulators, are the trustees of that obligation. So, and we will never forget our role, and we will always um, contradict political agenda in case financial regulation is being hijacked to pursue political purposes disregarding financial risk. So to the extent it is entirely compliant with a prudent portfolio management with a prudent um, valuation approach, with um, sort of a prudent person-principle approach, which is, as you all know, a key principle of Southern C2, we are extremely happy to support it, and we do. But that has to be observed. And indeed, as I said before, and I think uh, Bruno Le Maire made that point as well, he focused on stock and equity. I would even go further than that, and I made that point, Gabriel, when you were out. Um, I said it is a an entirely legitimate debate um, uh, in, as part of the Solvency II review to reconsider whether we have overdone um, sort of the market orientation and, and underestimating the benefit of illiquidity premiums if you're a um, hold to maturity investor, which most insurance companies are. Why? because that is a debate which is entirely compliant with the logic of a prudent regulation. That is not a proposal saying ignore risk, like green supporting factor. It is a very legitimate thing. Now, today, indeed, we are assuming to be a little bit black and white that any particular insurance company is supposed to liquidate all the assets they have by next Monday. That is, of course, a rather rigid assumption uh, uh, for valuing uh, uh, any particular balance sheet. I don't think that is necessarily um, the right approach. So in that sense, I am entirely with um, uh, Bruno Le Maire's um, appeal to reconsider um, the way we handle that. But I insist it has to be handled in a way which is compliant with financial risk. If we don't do that, I repeat myself, we would commit a huge tort for millions of policyholders. Um, well, that's sort of more sort of a core component on, on prudential requirements, but it's a very important one. Now, other than that, of course, um, it's much more practical challenges. The little shock you experienced uh, after your summer break mm. is something we are living under for a couple of years, yes. so we know it extremely well. So I'm, we're kind of bored about your surprise. No, um, I used to be happier uh, than you. And I, I, was, I was absolutely um, amazed uh, that 
listening to people like uh, uh, Jacques de la Rosière and so forth, um, speaking, speaking out in a way which in a German setting is sort of a quite normal thing to do. In the French setting is a, is a rather recent experience and I welcome you to the club <laughs> <laughs> of reconsidering certain things. I entirely agree, frankly, but that is a purely macroeconomic or monetary policy debate, which is a little bit outside of financial regulation. Um, I entirely agree with Jacques. That is a legitimate question um, whether or not the benchmark of 2% in today's world is a legitimate benchmark for, for in, 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 in forward guidance for inflationary target. I personally doubt whether that's an appropriate target in today's world. But that's not on me and people like myself to judge that as a, a um, monetary policy debate and, and a macroeconomic debate as such in a way. Um, now, of course, the primary concern from a regulatory and supervisory point of view is very simply speaking, making sure that as long as market conditions are as they are, as right or wrong as they may be, you can debate that endlessly, but as long as they are as they are, and you guys have to operate under such market conditions, we have to play our role to make sure, and of course you have to play your role to, to make sure, that um, the solvency of any particular institution can be kept safe. And as you all know, um, we in Germany, having been confronted with such a, such a situation for a number of years now, have introduced sort of an extra reserve um, requirement for the German life insurance company for now uh, six years in a row, um, uh, which is quite a burden for the industry. But as of today, we have accumulated an extra level of above uh, 70 billion uh, euros just for the 85-ish or so life insurers we have as an extra reserve, which of course adds an incredible level of resiliency in, in the collective balance sheet of such companies, that doesn't say it's over. No, it's not over. It's, 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 it's still a big challenge, and that tool will carry on um, uh, for the next, um, well, years to come. It's, it no, there's no time limit put on it. But um, it, it, of course, gives us as regulators, and I think millions of policyholders, a much higher level of comfort to know that this extra reserve mandatorily has to be kept as a capital cushion in the balance sheets of the industry. Now that is a very practical thing, which, which is a different level than just the, the big, big macroeconomic debate, but um, I think it's very, very important to, to secure trust in the insurance industry, because if that's broken, I think I said that in the, the other panel as well, um, everything else is kind of in vain. Um, so again, first things first. So we try to um, secure all sorts of different things on different levels. I would be tempted to add a, a whole bunch of other thoughts on some of the com sort of accompanying policies, let it be pensions, let it be some of the other issues you touched upon. That I will do that because then I would have to, to talk for another 30 minutes or so, um, which I don't think would be appropriate. But it, it's a very exciting range of issues we have to deal with, um, both on an operational level as well as more of a regulatory um, uh, level to, to keep things um, secure. Thank you so much. No, we, 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 we would share uh, this, uh, your ideas for more than 30 minutes quite willingly. So this is an in interesting for all the stakeholders here, what you've just uh, shared with us. Well, uh, the, the fiduciary duty of the insurer, we experiencing as a fundamental of our uh, trade, of our business, uh, it's the ability to uh, guarantee uh, the value of savings over the very long term, for example, and today one of the consequences of the situation of uh, uh, rates whose negative aspect is quite new, even in Germany, I believe, these very low rates. Well, it leads to a conflict between managing properly uh, an insurance company and at one point respecting your obligations towards the policyholders. I was interested to see how in the German system, you are able to have, in a way, 
uh, safeguards, uh, buffers that allow to avoid that kind of conflict and legitimacy and go through the hardships even on, uh, for a long time. And solvency too uh, is quite used in the German market. There are 20 year transitions in some clauses in order to be able to implement these disciplines. I now turn myself to Bernard de la, uh, uh, 15 years, 16 years, 16 years. For the French regulator Bernard de la this type of thought is it something that you would share, for example, with the Treasury Department. With uh, is are we also trying to adjust uh, regulations in this new situation? Uh, are you uh, agreeing with uh, Felix? First of all, I would like to share with Felix the fact that we need to adjust to the situation. Rates are low; they are even became a negative in France during last summer and our responsibility as supervisors and the role of the insurance uh, groups here in the room is to manage within that context uh, regardless uh, the reasons uh, behind such a situation and how we could break out of it more or less quickly. So in this context, let me just uh, outline very briefly because it's probably obvious for each one of you here what are the effects of this very low rates uh, context on the insurance uh, sector, on the non-life or on the uh, PNC? Well, it diminishes the returns of assets, makes necessary, especially in long-term investments, to have additional reserves, and it increases the risks uh, facing uh, insurances, insurance groups. So therefore, in the two types, in the, no, in the property and casualty or in the life business is an effect that we have seen strongly uh, during last summer on how to cover uh, solvency ratios. The first question that springs to mind, and uh, as a supervisor, I would like to analyze it, this decline, this impressive decline, and analysts were not prepared to it. So this decline in terms of the cover of the solvency ratio. Is it something that we need to be concerned about? Of course, as a supervisor, our obsession is to avoid by all means that there be a default or that it be in a European insurance company. Having said that, I believe that this decline in the ratios that we saw during the summertime is mechanically easy to understand and in a way we all wanted to have solvency uh, too, which is an indicator which in a prudential framework which is very sensitive to all kinds of risks and has to react when rates go down or become negative. So it what would have been surprising that with such declining rates that solvency ratios not being affected. Therefore, the situation is quite normal, which does not mean that we shouldn't be concerned about it. However, I don't think that such indicators mean, uh, in terms of solvency too, that there is an absolute uh, emergency. We're not in a crisis, but we have an advanced indicator that tells us whether uh, the rate context remains eternally what it is today, for years to come at least, uh, as it is today, the model of insurers will not be sustainable. Therefore, it will have to be modified, and you have enough time to do this. This is the message that comes from the drop in the uh, ratios that we noticed during the summer. Having said that, what are the levers on which uh, insurers can act in order to prepare themselves to face perhaps a context of uh, rates uh, close to zero or negative on a sustainable basis in, in a non-life insurance, we have to prepare uh, to pre we have to prepare ourselves of having fewer financial instruments. We should refocus on the quality of underwriting and increase gradually as long as competition allows that our prices. So we need a gradual adjustment. It will be painful for the players. 
and for consumers, but it is uh, rather easy to uh, foresee. It's a bit more difficult when you focus on the subject uh, addressed by the minister, which is the life insurance, especially collecting savings. In, in that sector, there are additional uh, conditions we have to prepare ourselves and prepare policyholders and savers, uh, i.e., the priorities uh, of uh, supervisors and the messages we put across. We do not make friends, only which we repeat again and again, which might be a first uh, a pri absolute priority, and that is uh, returns coming f from uh, life insurance uh, instruments, especially the Eurofund that was talked about at length today. These returns or yields are not sustainable, so therefore we need to bring them down more or less quickly, more or less uh, dramatically. We need to bring them down. It's a decision by each uh, player. Each insurer is in a different uh, position in relation to this, but if the context remains as it is, they'll have to do it. Even the general public can understand that. If you invest in a uh, 10-year bond and if the yield is negative, you cannot offer 180 per year for 10 years, uh, 180 per annum. You don't need solvency to, to understand that. This is a priority. Now, the second priority, uh, insurers, and that's natural, are tempted to manage this situation to uh, I, uh, to pass along uh, uh, the risk to their customers, so that there's a transfer of risk onto uh, clients. And as a supervisor, we are there to protect consumers, and therefore we pay close attention and will be ever more and more uh, attentive to this when you uh, spur customers of insurance uh, groups to move from the all guaranteed to the all risk of unit linked accounts. There are some precautionary measures to take in terms of information, disclosure, and advice to customers. This will be our second priority. And the third element, which has been widely commented here, we need to brace ourselves uh, to reinvent in this uh, very low rate context the business of uh, insurance, maybe reinvented or sometimes rediscovered because. In a way, these low rates, especially when they are negative, if we look at them from the market and customer general public or saver standpoint, and the saver, by the way, uh, as we said, we need to listen uh, to the saver and l listen to their concerns. So these low rates in mean also uh, uh, widespread pessimism about tomorrow's world. And this is why Agnès was saying that when you have savings, you need to consume it, but this is not probably the knee-jerk uh, reaction of most savers. On the contrary, they tend to think that in this context, I, saver, must protect myself and have to find more uh, safety. And this is where I have some food for thought for you. The business of uh, insurance is to sell cover and security, and if uh, and the, it's not to, to sell unit linked accounts, but to sell safety protection and covers that correspond to what actually in this context, which I hope will not be sustainable forever, which corresponds to a real need of the savers and clients, which is about getting cover and security and safety. And Xavier is telling me that I have to move fast now. Now, a few more words in regard to regulatory adjustments that are necessary, uh, in all likelihood, to make sure that regulations uh, come along this change in paradigm. And uh, in Europe and in France, well, in Europe, we have a directive, uh, Solvency II, and Gabrielle know it, knows it. We are not favorable to the fact that the requirements that weigh down on European insurers be increased. However, there's something which is, which is essential in the coming months, in the coming years, and that is the indicator coming from this uh, 
the solvency uh, cover ratio, we want it to ha be meaningful to mean something identical throughout uh, Europe. It would be very, a serious matter that such an indicator in a certain country means that everything is fine, and in the neighboring country, the opposite. I think it's very important, therefore, to focus on this matter and do our best so that across Europe we move towards methods that are really harmonized so that our, th th our barometer means the same thing across Europe. And my last point, but this was already extensively discussed, very probably we need to adjust and uh, prepare for uh, in this new uh, rate environment, we need to adjust the French regulation. And uh, this will keep us busy the next few weeks and the next few months. And I was very interested in hearing uh, how, uh, in what Felix said, uh, in hearing how the Germans uh, took ways and means, which are very similar to the uh, situation we are faced with in uh, France. No, I'm very sorry. We listened to you uh, three with great attention and interest, but uh, and I'm guilty for that. Uh, I haven't uh, kept, uh, I, ha I haven't been an effective uh, timekeeper, and uh, I would like to ask our panelists. Unfortunately, we won't have time for Q&A, but uh, great job. Thank you.